Hello, everybody, and welcome to the live Open SSL webinar, writing your first Open SSL application with our very own engineer, Neil Horman. My name is Kasha Subkota, and I will be moderating this webinar. As a reminder, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box or raise your hand to be unmuted if you'd like to ask the question live. As we are hosting a Q&A session following the presentation. As a reminder, this webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. And I invite everyone to follow us on our social media. So that's Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube at OpenSSL underscore, as well as um, emailing us at feedback, that's F-E-E-D-B-A-C-K at openssl.org if you have any additional questions or comments. And now I'm going to hand it over to Neil for the presentation. Thank you, Kajal, and good morning, afternoon, and evening, everybody uh, on the call here. Uh, we much appreciate your participation today. Uh, it's important to reach out to our communities and get important feedback from you. With that, let's get started. Uh, as Kajal noted, this is the next in our series of webinars, uh, writing an open SSL application. Uh, let's start with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, as Kajal noted, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A box to ask questions during the presentation. We have an excellent uh, uh, set of panelists here that'll be fielding your questions as we go through the presentation. Uh, this is the next in a series of webinars introduced in the open SSL library. Prior webinars are available on our YouTube link uh, below. You should all have a copy of this presentation, so you can just click through to the link at your convenience. Uh, code referenced in this presentation is also available at the link below on the GitHub gist uh, so that you can follow along. Instructions for compilation are at the top of the file, so please feel free to make liberal use of that as you see fit. And as always, uh, OpenSSL code is open source, and you can get that code uh, along with uh, community interaction and support at our GitHub page listed at the link below. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we're going to figure out how to leverage the OpenSSL library in applications that you, the audience, writes. Uh, ideally, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to uh, find slash locate API calls in OpenSSL to accomplish your application's objectives uh, by using our extensive documentation. You should be able to understand how to call them properly and therefore integrate them with your application. You should be able to run that uh, application and understand the output. And lastly, and I believe most importantly, you should be able to recognize, identify, and fix programming errors uh, in our library usage. And we'll be going over all of that today. I've made some assumptions uh, in the writing of this presentation uh, listed below. Uh, notably, in the interests of time, this presentation assumes the following. Uh, I assume that you, the audience, are familiar with coding applications in C because that is the language that OpenSSL is written in. If not, that's okay. There's plenty of documentation out there to get you familiar with it. Uh, you should also note that there are several bindings for other languages that you can use with OpenSSL. So if you are more familiar with another language, that'll be uh, available to you in other repositories that we don't maintain but are fairly mature and robust. I also assume that the audience is familiar with high-level uh, cryptography concepts. Uh, we expect that you are familiar with what a cipher is versus a message digests, so on and so forth. Again, if you're not, don't worry. Plenty of documentation out there to familiarize yourself uh, on your own time, and you can always ask questions if need be. Uh, we also assume that the OpenSSL library has been installed on your system. Uh, I would refer you to the prior videos on our YouTube channel to learn how to do that if that's not done already. Uh, we have some excellent videos to help walk you through that. Additionally, and perhaps more importantly, this code that we're going over today prioritizes illustration and education ahead of security, uh, which I know is something of an oddity for a, a uh, library meant for cryptography and secure communication. Uh, we ignore security concerns here that a real world application would need, again, in the interests of making sure that you understand how the application uh, works. We feel that's more important here in this video uh, than building it securely. Uh, however, you should keep your own security requirements and standards in mind when writing your own applications. So the first question we want to ask is, what do we want to write? Uh, 
in preparing for this presentation, I tried to think of ideas that would motivate the writing of an application. And in so doing, I thought of my son. Uh, he is an athlete. He is a, a collegiate swimmer, very much likes athletics. Uh, interestingly, however, he is also a big fan of role-playing games, particularly social deduction games. These games occasionally require that he communicate with players privately, i.e. he has to tell them things that other players in the game shouldn't be privy to. So I'd like him to have an app that easily sends short private messages to other players. It's a bit of a silly application, but we can suspend disbelief here for the purpose of education. Uh, he could just whisper to these players, but it'd be kind of nice for him to send secure text because it's fun for him. So let's write him an application to do that. Uh, we have some requirements for this application, of course. The application should take a shared password as input number one. It should take an operation as input number two, i.e. it should encode or decode a message appropriately. It should take the actual message as input three. So if he wants to say you need to do X or the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, uh, that would be the message that he wants to send. And as an output, it should provide a message suitable for sending via text message or email or some ASCII-based communication medium. So what do we need to do this? Uh, we could use any number of things to do this. I've opted to use the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. I made that selection uh, for a few reasons. Uh, most notably, it's a symmetric cipher, uh, which is easy to use and understand. The password you use to encode it is the same that you use to decode it. And it also matches with our need for such a shared secret password. So it seems like a fairly good fit to me. So let's create the skeleton application. This is a pretty rote operation. We include our uh, standard libraries to do input and output. We define the operations that we want to perform. As mentioned previously, we want to be able to encode or decode the message. And we'll create a main routine here. Uh, the main routine has a few local variables that codify what our message is and what the operation should be. We do some sanity checking on those. We want to make sure we have the right number of arguments and we fail the uh, the application in case those requirements aren't met. And then we do some basic uh, processing of those, those parameters. We check our second argument to make sure we're doing an encode or a decode. We set our operation value accordingly so that we can do control flow in a moment. And if neither of those are met again, we do some failure checking and fail the application. Pretty straightforward. However, it does absolutely nothing useful, which is perhaps not surprising. So now we need to add the work to do our encryption or decryption. How do we do that? Well, OpenSSL provides extensive documentation. Uh, it comes in the form of man pages. So if you have a local installation from your distribution of choice, you should be able to run the man command with OpenSSL blah or, or one of the, uh, the function calls uh, and get a man page for that. That can, of course, be a little difficult because man doesn't always provide the best indexing or searching features. And as such, it's also available on our website at OpenSSL.org in a web-based format. And that is searchable, which is nice. So we're using AES. So let's just go to OpenSSL.org and put AES uh, in the search bar of the website. And the first result that comes back is this link below for EVP Cipher AES, which looks very relevant to us. I should also note here that we are using the 3.2 version of the OpenSSL man pages. Uh, there are many versions of OpenSSL available. Man pages for each release are documented on the website and available via various links on the web pages you visit. Looking at the EVP Cipher AES webpage, we can see that it indicates all the forms of AES that OpenSSL supports, which are numerous, and it points us to the EVP encrypt init function. Following that link, we get documentation on what EVP encrypt init does, which sets us up to do an encryption. So let's add that in. We include the appropriate header file from the documentation. We check to see if we're doing an encode operation because we don't want to use encrypt init for a decode operation. If we are doing an encrypt operation or an encode operation, we call EVP encrypt init, checking for the appropriate failure conditions and passing the appropriate parameters. As you can see here, I've added comments to the parameters because I don't yet know what those are. I don't know what this first parameter is. Uh, I see that the second parameter is a cipher object, which we need. We also need a key, and we need an initial vector. So we're missing something. 
The first parameter is an EVP cipher context object or CTX object in OpenSSL parlance. Looking up EVP cipher CTX on the website, we can see the documentation page says that we can get that from a call to EVP cipher CTX new. So we'll add that in there. That seems pretty straightforward. Additionally, we need an EVP cipher object. Uh, the cipher object from the documentation tells us what type of cipher we're using. And the docs indicate that we can get that with a call to EVP cipher fetch. Also fairly easy. We'll add that in in a moment. Additionally, we need a key and an initial vector. The key is provided on the command line as discussed, but from understanding AES, we know we shouldn't use the provided password as an AES key directly for a few reasons. Uh, most notably, it makes the key very easy to guess. Anybody looking over your shoulder can guess what the key is. It's also discouraged because AES doesn't use variable, length. well, it does use variable length passwords, uh, and those lengths don't necessarily match the size of the key that's required. AES, we know from independent research, requires a minimum 128-bit key. There's no guarantee that the password that we pass on the command line will be 128 bits long, so we need to modify that somehow. Most notably, we modify that by using a key derivation function. We'll have to look up how to do that. And lastly, we need an initial vector. We know again from independent research that AES requires an initial vector that can be any randomly generated uh, binary string and should be included with the message for decryption because it's needed symmetrically. Um, let's start with generating a key from a password. We know we want to use a key derivation function here to translate the command line offered password into a key of an appropriate length. If we look for key derivation function or KDF on the website, the first thing we hit here is EVP KDF single step. It looks like uh, an easy single step key derivation function. I should note here that it was mentioned to me when writing this, that it might be preferable to use a password-based key derivation function here. However, unfortunately, my uh, uh, shame is that I did not have time to change it, but I've I've decided to keep this here because it offers a great illustration that KDF functions and many cryptography operations uh, are available that can be freely interchanged. They may not necessarily fit your security requirements or other requirements that you have, but they can be used, and this is a good illustration thereof. Looking at the single step KDF, we see that it's got an example which is great for us because it means we can effectively copy and paste that, uh, which is great, makes life easier for us. And it looks like it makes use of some other functions that we might need to do some additional research on, most notably the OSSL param construct something functions. Plugging that back into the website, we see that we have a man page for that. Uh, and it tells us exactly what those parameter construction operations are doing. And the first link above in the KDF single step man page show us what appropriate parameters we can set for this KDF. So let's create a function to do that. We're going to add this function into our code called derive key. It's going to accept a couple parameters. It's going to accept a, a character array that is our secret, and we'll pass that in in a moment. It's going to accept a character pointer that is the output, that is to say the key that we're actually going to use with encrypting the message. And it's going to accept an output length, which specifies how long this array is. In the body of the function, we're going to do what the KDF single step example did almost verbatim. We're going to fetch the KDF and we're going to specify which one we want. In this case, it's single step KDF. We're going to create a new context object and assign the KDF to it. That'll tell the context to use that KDF type when we actually make use of it. And we're going to assign parameters for it. We create several parameters here. The first being the digest that the KDF is going to use. I've selected the SHA-256 digest. We're also going to input a parameter that is the key that we're going to use. The key being the secret that gets passed in to the function signature. And lastly, we're going to set this param info parameter, uh, which the man page indicates is optional, but makes for easier management if you're using several KDF instances. Since it was in the example, I'll include it. And lastly, we're going to end the parameter array for uh, uh, safety and processing sanity. 
And then we're going to call EVP KDF Drive as the example in the KDF man page indicates. We're going to give it our context, which in turn indicates what KDF we're using. We're going to give it our output buffer, tell it how long it is, and we're going to pass it the parameters that we set. Then we're going to free up the memory that we allocated in here. And on return from the function, the output array should contain a key size that is appropriate for use in our encrypt function. Integrating that with our main routine, we're going to see here that we call derive key. The first parameter that we pass is argv1. That happens to be the password that is passed in on the command line. We're going to pass in a locally allocated key array, and we're going to say that key array is 16 bytes long, 16 bytes being 128 bits. And so it matches the requirements at a minimum for using AES. So on return from this function, our key should be computed and available in this array. Generating an IV, we know AES requires a minimum of a 128-bit initial vector. How do we generate that? Lots of ways we can generate random data, but a quick search of the OpenSSL website shows that if we search for RAND, we have this function, RAND bytes. As it happens, OpenSSL provides random data generation functions, which is very useful to us. We can add that in here when we're doing an encode. We call rand bytes. We have a predefined 16 byte array, uh, initial vector array. We tell it it's got to be 16 bytes long. On output, IV will now be filled in with a random uh, initial vector for us. So, now we can update our EVP encrypt init call with the key and IV functions. We still need a context and we still need a cipher, of course. Let's handle those next. The full added encryption code here with the ciphers and context added shows as follows. We do an EVP cipher fetch as the EVP encrypt init man page indicated. We tell it what kind of cipher we want to use, AES 128 CBB. We create a new context, as the man page indicated. We create our initial vector, as previously noted. And then we call EVP encrypt init with all of our filled out parameters, the context, the cipher, the key, and the initial vector. We do some error checking. Then we set up our output message. We call EVP encrypt update, which was documented in the EVP encrypt init man page. We pass it our context again, the output message buffer, the length of the output message buffer, the input message, which was provided on the command line, and the length of the input message. We check our errors, and then we call EVP encrypt init, or excuse me, EVP encrypt final. This encrypts any remaining data that is not an integral value of the block size. This is a general pattern with EVP uh, in encrypt operations and is well documented in the man page. After we've done that, we add the remaining length to our output length and print it out on the command line. Seems like everything we need to do. So let's run it. We compile our code. We tell it what our input password is. I've cleverly selected password here. We tell it we want to encode this message, and we tell it what the message is. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. And the output says no EVP. Well, that's not good. So. Obviously, something's failed. The next question to ask is, how do we get some more information about a failed API call? Back to the website. Typing in error on the search uh, bar on the OpenSSL site provides us with this function as one of the first returned values, error print errors. As it turns out, OpenSSL has an entire error reporting API we can use. So let's add that in to get some visibility on what's going on with this problem. Augmenting our code here, we can see that no EVP is printed when EVP cipher fetch fails. So in addition to that, let's add a call to error print errors FP, which the documentation says is a variant of error print errors. In this case, allowing us to redirect all that output to a file pointer, in which case here I've selected standard error. So it'll print to the console. Let's rebuild it and try again. We run our compiled command, give it a password, tell it we want to encode and our message. We get the same no EVP error here, but now we get some additional output that tells us a little bit more about what's going on. And we have our solution. So 
there's a lot of information in here. If you want to know more about everything that's going on with this error message, you can refer to our Getting Started video on the YouTube channel for more information on the error string format. It's also documented on the website in the error, error string webpage, uh, which is linked from the error print errors webpage we searched before. And we can see here that this is the function that failed, inner EVP generic fetch, which is somewhere in the library. The error that it's reporting is unsupported. So something is unsupported that we're trying to do. This is the file and line that it specifically failed on. If you want to dig down into the library source code to see what's happening, tells us what our default uh, library context is, which is not always relevant, uh, uh, but maybe depending on your uh, use case. And it shows here what algorithm was attempting to be referenced when this unsupported error occurred. And you can see here the algorithm that we were using was AES-128-CBB, which is our problem. From prior research on how AES works, uh, I recognize now that because of my robust fingers, I mistyped the cipher that I input. It should be AES-128-CBC, counterblock cipher. AES-128-CBB is non-existent. Easy fix now that we see what's going on. We just have to update the call to AE or to EVP cipher fetch to be the proper cipher. Updating that and running it again, we see we provide a password, our encode operation, and our message. And now we get some output. That's a step forward, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, specifically, it doesn't meet our requirements for being pasteable to an email or text. That's binary output with lots of unprintable characters. So that's no good. What do we do about that? My first thought is when I want ASCII all the time, I do a base 64 encode of whatever message I'm using. It translates everything to ASCII, works fairly well. But I'm not really in a position to want to re-implement base 64 because there's other things that can do it. I could go find a library that does it. But let me check OpenSSL first to see if it's got anything that it can help with. Inserting base 64 into the search bar on the website results in seeing this link. As it turns out, OpenSSL provides an I.O. API for which there are a number of encoders to do all sorts of, of filtering, redirection, what have you. And among them, it includes a base64 encoder. I think we could use that quite well. Let's add some more code in here. Previously, we were just printfing the output message to the console, which isn't working. Instead, let's create a new base64 encoder using the BIO new call that we looked up against the BIO FBase64 encoder. If we successfully allocate one, we can push another encoder onto that. BIO, according to the documentation, supports the chaining of block IO objects. To the base64 encoder, we'll add a new BIO file pointer block IO object. A file pointer just takes the input from the prior BIO and outputs it to a file pointer. In this case, I'm selecting the standard output file pointer. To that, I'm also passing some flags here, most notably BIO no close. It's not smart, it's sane to close standard out in your application. So we're going to tell this BIO here that when we free this, we're not going to close the underlying file pointer. If that's successful, we're going to write some stuff to the BIO. The first thing we're going to write is the initial vector. As previously noted, the initial vector needs to be shared, much like the key, between the sender and receiver. So we're going to encode that into the message. So we write the IV into the base64 encoder, which will base64 encode it for a length of whatever this length is, in this case, 16 bytes. We'll make sure that got written properly. If that succeeds, we'll continue by writing to the base64 encoder the actual encoded output message for whatever length it is. We'll make sure that succeeds. If it does, we flush both of them, do some error handling if it doesn't. Otherwise, we're done. Once again, under the breach, we compile our code. We tell it what our password is, tell it we're doing an encode operation, giving it our message. And now this looks much better. We have an encoded message that is all ASCII characters, suitable for sending over ASCII-based communications mediums. Hooray, we are now halfway done. 
Reversing the process is a symmetric exercise, whereas previously we encoded a message by taking some plain text, doing some encode operations, and writing it out to a BIO. We're now going to set up a BIO to read in that message and then do some decode work. To do that here, we use our prior knowledge from, from her reading. We create a new BIO, a base64 encoder, just like we did before. Now, instead of creating a new file pointer for, uh, uh, BIO object, we're going to create a new membuff object, which is documented on the same page as all the other BIOs. To that membuff, we're going to pass our input message, which was provided on the command line, tell it how long it is, and this will create a BIO that just reads from memory. We're going to attach those two BIOs together, so the B base64 decoder will now be reading from the memory buffer. Easy peasy. Do some error handling. Now we're going to set some flags that are specific to these BIOs based on the documentation. The base64 BIO indicates that the decoder specifically expects to have a new line at the end of the message. Because we're reading, we know, from an underlying memory buffer, we know that new line doesn't exist. So we tell the BIO, yeah, don't worry about the new line. Additionally, the memory buffer BIO indicates that it normally returns end of file when it reaches the end of the memory buffer. We don't want to do that here because base64 encoder man page indicates that it doesn't handle EOFs properly. So we just tell it return zero when you're done. Once we've got that set up, we do a mem set of our binary input message, and then we just do a read of the base64 decoder. We tell it to read in the message, it pulls it in from the message buffer and decodes it back into a binary message that's now available in this UADATE T array. Do some more error handling. Now, we need to extract our initial vector. We take this binary message. We know from our, our formatting of the input message that our initial vector is the first thing in the message, and we know how long it is. So we extract that from the binary message for a size of 16 bytes and store it in the initial vector array. Once we've done that, we set up our decrypt init context, just like we did on encrypt. We tell it what our context is, which we've allocated above in the code. We tell it what our cipher is, which we allocated in the same way with an EVP cipher fetch call to the AES-128 CBC cipher. We tell it what our key is. We've derived our key just like we did on the encrypt operation using the password provided on the command line with a KDF function. And we've passed our IV, which we've extracted from the message immediately above here. Do some error checking, set up our output message, and do an EVP decrypt update call which takes our input message, stores it to an output message. And you'll note here that we start our input message 16 bytes in. This is because the initial vector wasn't actually part of the encrypted message. So we need to index that far into the current input message. And we need to reduce our length by the same amount. Do some error checking. And here we call EVP decrypt final. Just like the encrypt final call, if there is a non uh, block size integral number of bytes in the message. This picks up any remaining bytes and processes them appropriately. We make sure the output message that we've decrypted is null terminated so we don't accidentally run off the end of the array. And we output the message on the console. Let's give it a final test. We run our command. We give it our password. Here, instead of encode, we tell it to decode. And we give it the encoded message that we received earlier. And the console tells us the output message is the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. That checks. Everything works. Hooray. My son can now send private messages to his role-playing game buddies. We've done something good today. That brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, some parting thoughts for you. Uh, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I've showed you here probably a dozen open SSL calls. Uh, OpenSSL literally has hundreds of APIs to perform thousands of cryptographic operations. There's lots of other useful utilities in here. I encourage you all to start reading and seeing how you can leverage it in your applications. Don't forget to use other tools in your toolbox. Uh, OpenSSL supports the use of various debug tools, uh, GDB, Valgrind, ThreadSAN, UBSAN, any number of, of tools that can gain you visibility into problems uh, you may encounter with your application. Uh, 
it should be noted here, cryptography is an inherently complex process. Uh, and for anybody that's tried it before, you can do everything right and things can still come out not quite how you expect. Fixing that, the key to, to doing so is visibility and these tools will help you. I strongly, strongly encourage you to make liberal use of them. Uh, lastly, uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, OpenSSL being an open source project has a very robust community uh, and we enjoy helping people solve problems. Uh, GitHub is our, our primary uh, source of communication, although we have several email uh, lists that you're welcome to subscribe to. Uh, but GitHub is primarily the point of contact where you'll be able to get uh, uh, answers to whatever questions you have, report issues, and uh, help improve the code if you're so inclined. Uh, and remember, there are no silly questions. We're willing to help, and this is complicated stuff, so don't be afraid to speak up. Uh, and lastly, maybe buy a support contract. Um, I know that seems like a bit of a, a plug, um, but uh, for several of you in the, the corporate world here, uh, your corporation's leadership may be somewhat risk averse. Uh, OpenSSL being an open source project that can sometimes lead to, to concerns. Uh, and we do have uh, mechanisms there in place such that if you wish to limit your risk, uh, a support contract can help you with uh, service level agreements to ensure that there are timely responses uh, to whatever questions you may have. And with that, we're done. I'll turn it back over to Kajal for any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neil, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you, everyone else, for attending this webinar. As a reminder, um, I'd like to remind everybody that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. And please check out our YouTube channel for previous webinars that we've done. Uh, this will also be the spot for future webinars <laughs> that we're planning to do. So please check out our YouTube as well as our other social media at Twitter and LinkedIn. We're just at OpenSSL underscore on all of them. Super easy to find us. Um, and as Neil said, uh, you can either ping us on GitHub or email us at feedback, that's F-E-E-D-B-A-C-K at openSSL.org if you have any questions or comments or, um, I don't know, maybe you'd like to receive the slide deck, then please feel free to email us and we'll be happy to send that over to you. Other than that, thank you so much and I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of their day. Thank you all. Appreciate your participation.